about to do this again for the second time. So on Tuesday, we had a very intimate conversation up front. I got to ask some of those questions that people might think are silly, but questions that I just really want to know. I'm going to go there again today. So there's a lot about academia here. Some of us are relearning our history, um, but recovering our cultural memory. That's something that I went home the same night, one o'clock in the morning, we were texting each other and you came up with something quite um, interesting. Somebody had approached you, Brother Browder, about coming on their platform and doing an interview. And I went straight to their YouTube and I looked at the, the audience and I looked at who had gone on before and I thought to myself, ooh, you're going to be amongst the minority. Something that you said today in the presentation um, about your um, Pierre Van Sertima who um, wrote They Came Before Columbus and saying that that was the last book that he wrote. Um, and I thought to myself, wow, if you put yourself in the limelight like that, are we, a limelight like that, are we at risk of you being targeted the minute we get to a certain level and we start sharing knowledge, powerful knowledge, are we at risk of getting shut down very quickly? Um, to recite what Van Sertima said, that um, writing that came before Columbus was the end of his academic career. So Van Sertima taught at Rutgers. Uh, that came before Columbus was published uh, by Random House, which is a major, major publisher in the States. And for 20 years, Van Sertima was the editor and uh, the publisher of the Journal of African Civilizations, which he featured um, publications focusing on the African presence in early Asia, the African presence in early Europe, the African presence in early America, great black thinkers, uh, great uh, African women. It's just a whole series of publications. And uh, he was always having problems with the printer, with, with the distribution. So I've eliminated those problems in my career because I'm the publisher. I publish, I produce, for real, for real. I publish and I'm responsible for distributing my information so nobody has control over my editorial content. Uh, if you want to make sure that you can get your word out, then you control everything from A to Z, as you all say here. We say Z, you all say Z, right? <laughs> but uh, for me, that's part of, that's the importance of being able to control your story. Uh, ben Sertima taught at uh, at Rutgers University, so he was constrained by that academic environment. I, as I mentioned to you on Tuesday, I've been self-employed since 1979. I, I work for myself. Uh, my daughter works for me. Uh, I have a business. We've got you know, a staff of, of about 15 people who also work for me. So I have the benefit of not working for white folk or crazy Negroes. So I can do what I want to, when I want to do it, and, and that has given me a, a greater sense of freedom. On your entrepreneurism, um, we had this conversation again, and um, I'm just going to keep it really basic. How does a black person acquire wealth and sustain that wealth in order to do their business, to live in purpose, to build, to recreate, to reshare knowledge? You have to be good. You have to be consistent. Uh, I'm, I'm sure most people here don't know. Most people know me as a, as a writer, as an archaeologist, as an Egyptologist, as a lecturer, as, as a researcher. But I have no academic credentials in any of those fields. I'm not a trained historian. I'm not a trained public speaker. Speaker. I'm not a trained researcher. I'm not a trained Egyptologist. I'm not a trained archaeologist. Uh, I'm not a trained writer. These are things that I learned to do because I love doing them. And so I have made them my profession. Uh, I am formally trained as a graphic designer uh, and artist. That, that was my major. Graphic design and advertising was my major. So uh, I've only worked a nine to five for two and a half years. And I came to realize during that two and a half years that as long as I worked for someone else, they would never pay me what I was worth. So I decided that I was going to start my own business and I started off freelancing, doing freelance design while I was working as a supervisor in a graphic design studio. So I worked in the evening, on the evening shift. So I would go out in the morning and rustle up clients. And then in the evening, when myself and just a small team of people are there in the studio working, I'm using my employer's equipment 
equipment and his supplies to do my work for my clients. <laughs> and after about nine months or so, I was making as much money on my own as I was working doing my nine to five, and that's when I decided to, to leave. So I left in 1979 and never looked back. So two things that, that I've learned from being independent. One is you have to be good. And the most important thing is that you have to be on time because most people are lazy and most people aren't on time. So if I have a record of being on time, then I automatically stand up above everybody else. But black people are never on time. And, 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 and so I'm glad you asked that question, made that statement. You didn't ask the question, you made the statement. So there is this thing in the States, I don't know if they have it here, uh, CP time, right? Color people's time. Black people are always late. My BMT time. BMT, uh, yeah, you, you said that yesterday. BMT is what? Black man's time. Black man's time. So let me give this to you. I'm giving this to you all for free, right? Africans invented time. We talked about this on Tuesday. The first people, the first people to divide the day into 24 hours. The first people to divide the year into 365 and a quarter days. We know that the oldest calendar ever created was created by Africans as late as 4,230 BC, before Caucasians. That's real. So if we created time, and if we also understand that everything in the universe happens on time, the sun rises and sets on time. The moon goes through its phases on time. The constellations move through the sky on on time. So you as a black person, when you're late, you're out of sync with the universe. That's why everything fails. Period. So once you, so my thing, my thing is, my thing is, my philosophy is if you're on time, you're late. You get there early. You get there early, so you got time to compose yourself and do what needs to be done while everybody else comes straggling in, wondering what's going on. I don't have time for people who are late. I can't tolerate people who are late. So the key to, to my being successful is respecting time, respecting my ancestors and respecting time, all right? And then using my time judiciously. I don't, I don't, my, since I work for myself, I don't waste my time watching football games and basketball games because those folk make millions of dollars. So why should I spend my time watching a millionaire when I could be making money myself. I spend my time reading, researching, engaging in conversation with people who are doing something, right? So to me, that's, a, that's the best investment of my time. So the majority of people, the majority of people won't do that. They don't know how to do that. They don't have the patience to do that, the temperament to do that. And that's them, that's on them. That's on them. Everybody creates their own life. Yeah. Everybody creates the circumstances of their lives by what they do or what they don't do. So we don't have time to waste. I don't believe in wasting time. You know when you feel like you've just been so, shut so, down? So, 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 CP time, I refer to CP time as conquered people's time. Okay. You know, my partner who's sat here today is looking at me with the eyes, you know, but we're giving our time on our anniversary to be here with you, so it's a good use of time. So what that suggests to me, what that suggests to me is it's an investment in your future. Now, you could be out at the club, you could be out at the club doing something else that, that's not going to benefit you a month from now, a year from now, but you're getting something tonight, right, that's going to last forever. I love that. I'm going to make another statement, quite a bold statement, uh, and it goes to, um, it, it challenges all of us, but this assumption that black people don't read, and following on from that, because you are well read, do you find um, that you come up against people who critique where you source that information from? Is that information even real? The people who ask that question are the people who don't read, who are literate. So that doesn't mean anything to me. It really doesn't mean anything to me. I do my research. So I, what happens when, when you do come up against people who say, oh, you, you've made this up to make black people look great because you know that you guys are struggling, you need something, so you're trying to give them a little bit of hope? Can I let you in on the secret? Yeah. All right. One of the things that, that I learned from Van Sertima was never say, to never say anything in public that you can't back up with at least four sources of documentation. So I document everything that I do. Uh, we do our Egypt on the Potomac field trip, right? That field trip is, is 31 years old, where I document the ancient comedic influences on the layout, design, and development of the United States of America. And in the 31 years that we've been doing this field trip, I have never had any white person challenge me. Why? Because I cite all of my references, and most of them are white. 
And one of the things that I've learned is that when a white person encounters a black person like me who is more intelligent than they think I am, who knows more about a subject matter than they do, the last thing in the world they're going to they're going to do is to challenge me and look stupid. <laughs> so they may not agree with everything that I have to say, but they'll be quiet for fear of looking like a fool. Is there ever a time to be quiet in terms of you have this information, you're in a certain environment, it's like, you know what, sharing this information could actually be damaging? Well, look, it's not a matter, matter of it being damaging, it's a matter of being strategic. You don't have to go around shooting your mouth out all the time. You don't have to do that. Uh, there, many people talk because they're trying to impress folk. I'm not trying to impress anybody. You know, I speak when I feel the need to speak. And actually, believe it or not, I'm quiet most of the time. I'm a very quiet person. I really am. I observe people. And I can gain more just by watching people than by talking to most people. And if I encounter somebody who, who I feel knows more than me, and they don't know who I am, they don't know what I know, I'll just ask them a question or two and get them to start talking. And most people like to talk. Most white people like to talk about history and things. And so I'll ask them a question or two, and they'll go on 5, 10, 15 minutes. I'm taking mental notes. <laughs> and they're giving, me, they're giving me answers to questions I haven't even asked yet. Right? So it's about realizing that there are many people out here much smarter than me. They have access to more information than I'll ever have access to. And it's about cultivating uh, uh, relationships with people and, and being strategic about what you do. Uh, um, so I, I like to be undercover. I like to go places where nobody knows who I am and just listen. And just listen. I can learn more by listening than I can by talking sometimes. Thank you. In terms of um, restoring cultural memory, uh, and again, you've touched on it earlier on, you've touched on it just now, Sometimes when you are armed with that information, you might say too much, you might not say enough, but being melanated people, there's always a quick reference and link to mental um, health issues, mental disease, um, when the mind starts talking. But you were talking on Tuesday about the connection to the spiritual world. How You've written the book Surviv Survival Strategies for, Americans in, um, for Africans in America. How does one survive in this society armed with so much information, acquiring so much knowledge? How do we function? Well, uh, it, it's really a matter of moving beyond survival. We've been surviving for 500 years, all right? So we need to understand where we are. We need to understand the environment. And once you understand the environment, then like, for example, in the States right now, you know, we have a president who is crazy, right? <laughs> who is out of his mind. And and I hear, I hear many of our people uh, complaining about him. And the mere fact that a black person is complaining about, about the president, I refuse to say his name because I'm not giving him any power. Uh, and the mere fact that so many people complain about him is an indication to me that they don't understand the system of racism and white supremacy. You should never be surprised by what he does. And if you are surprised, it means that you haven't done your homework. So I'm very clear about who he is, what he represents, and what he does. So I'm never surprised by what he does. And knowing, knowing his nature, and I know his nature by studying his history. And it is a history of death, destruction, death and destruction. So this is not to put anybody down, but if you look at the history of Europeans, everywhere Europeans have gone outside of Europe, they have discovered other people, conquered other people, enslaved other people, and destroyed their environment. That is what they've done better than anybody else on this planet. So why should you be upset when they do what they've always done? I mean, if you know history, then, then you have a, a better understanding of how to deal with them. Now, now let me just say this uh, so that nobody gets uncomfortable. I'm speaking in broad, general terms, and there are some good white folk out here, just as there are some crazy Negroes out here. So you have to be able to determine who, 
who you should listen to and who you should give your energy to, who you should withhold your energy from. Um, I think it was a Greek philosopher who said that the best trait that a person could ever develop is the judicious sense to know what not to believe, right? So let me, let me share this with you. I, I got an email last night in terms, of, in terms of craziness. Craziness comes in all forms. I got an email last night from somebody that, uh, that I don't know, but dig this email. Dear Mr. Browder, I send you this message to urge you and others not to dig up the sites of our ancestors. These are sacred sites. My wife, Nefertari Ife, is a spirit medium, channeler, and the commissions in the spirit have told her to pass on this message. They took, they took that knowledge with them. To gain this knowledge, one has to meditate and come, to, come with a clean heart, and the knowledge and understanding uh, you seek will be revealed. They are high spiritual beings, and their knowledge cannot be found in bricks and mortar as these are just a manifestation of this spiritual knowledge. We have recordings from these ancestors that we are willing to share with those who want to listen. These recordings include Pharaohs Akhenaten, Seti I, Hatrasit, King Tut, and Kemetic uh, Collective speaking from the spirit world. Now, do I believe that shit? No. I don't believe it. It's nonsense. I have enough sense to know what not to believe, all right? I have enough sense to know that the ancestors speak to me as well. I have enough sense to know, as we do at that site, when we come every year, we pour libations at that site. We come to that site and I speak to Karaka men and tell him that we have come as tomb restorers, not tomb robbers. I have enough sense to know that he has opened the door for us. I have enough sense to know that he protects us. He protects all of our mission members. So we work with spirit. So there are folk who make some wild accusations. Wild accusations. And I'm at the point in my life where I don't have time for nonsense. Right? If you say something, have the physical evidence to back it up. If you can't back it up, shut up. <laughs> Period. I don't have time. For, I, I don't have time for nonsense. So um, I said this week so we can finish up. So again, at this stage in my life, I'm beginning to advocate what I refer to as cultural triage. Cultural triage. Everyone understands what triage is, is in, in the medical parlance. But when you encounter somebody, and this is this is what I live by. When I encounter somebody, and I travel all over the world. I meet thousands of people every month. I have learned to develop the good sense to be able to read somebody and within, within five minutes, I know whether or not I'm gonna to listen to you for five minutes, listen to you for, for 10 minutes or turn and walk away. You gotta be able to read somebody, read their energy and know whether or not they have something of value to offer or if they're gonna be a psychic vampire and just drain your energy by asking you foolish questions over and over and over again or try to impress you with something that doesn't make any sense. You gotta be able to make those snap judgments in a short period of time because we don't have a lot of time, okay? Okay. Okay. Please describe to me the feeling, and to all of us, the feeling, um, the, the emotional, spiritual um, sense that you get on returning to Kemet. <coughs> Take us back, Sankofa, to the first time. All right, I'll, I'll share this story with you. First time I went to Kemet in 1980, I knew nothing about Kemetic history. Uh, as I mentioned before, my background is in design and advertising, and, and prior to majoring in design and, and, and um, advertising, uh, my freshman year in college at the University of Illinois, I majored in architecture. So I've been drawing all of my life. I love buildings. I love the whole process behind conceptualizing and creating buildings and the sacred spaces around them. So uh, when I first went to Egypt in 1980, I was interested in the pyramids. I wanted to study the architecture of the pyramids. And um, went there with Dr. Ben in the group, and I had my two cameras. This is 1980, so I'm, I'm taking pictures inside of the pyramid. Had my two Canon cameras. One, I shot ectochrome slide film. The other, I shot black and white film, right? And I go inside the pyramids. I'm taking my pictures, get back to my hotel room, and I realize that in my haste to load the film in my camera, it didn't take up on the this, on this, on this spindle. So none of the shots came out. And I'm saying to myself, I came all the way here for this and I've missed my opportunity. Well, it turned out that the next day, uh, we had a free day. So I decided I'm going back to the pyramid and I'm gonna take these pictures again. So I got up early in the morning, five, six o'clock in the morning, put my two cameras in my backpack, 
got my film, walking out the door, and something said, Browder, grab your flashlight. I said, I don't need the flashlight. Browder, grab your flashlight. Went back, got my flashlight, put it in my book bag, went to the pyramid, walked up to uh, the entrance to the pyramid, and the guy told me, oh, the pyramid is closed today. Why? Because there's no electricity. Huh. Huh. I was here yesterday, so I know where everything is, and I had my flashlight, and I go in, he looked at me like I was crazy, and said, if you want to. So I went inside the pyramid by myself, right, with my flashlight. So I'm taking my pictures, I'm, I'm checking my f-stop, I'm checking the shutter speed, doing all this stuff, taking my pictures, and as soon as I took the last frame, the roll of 36, as soon as I took my last shot, the lights came on. I said, okay, let me put another roll in the camera, go through and, and, and shoot everything again so I make sure I got it, you know, uh, backing, backing myself up. So I put that second roll of film in, I shot everything, and as soon as I took the last frame in that frame of 36, guess what happened? The lights went out. So I said, okay, obviously I'm supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be here, so what am I gonna do now? I took my pictures, and I, I trust everything came out well. Let me go back up to the king's chamber and let me meditate inside the king's chamber. So I went back up to the king's chamber, I'm sitting there, settling myself down, getting into a nice vibe, a nice meditation, and I'm thinking to myself, here I am, inside of the king's chamber, Khufu's pyramid. I'm in the center of the land mass of the planet, by myself, in the dark, and nobody knows where I am. <laughs> Anything could happen to me, and nobody knows where I am. So as soon as I started entertaining the thought of fear, you know, I felt how that was taking me off point. And I said, and then that same voice that told me to grab my flashlight said, well, brother, you don't have anything to be afraid of. You are okay. You are protected. So I got into my meditation and, uh, and just vibed on, on where I was and how I felt being there, right? And then saw myself next week, we'll be in Aswan, and then two weeks after that, I'll be back home in Maryland, and all of this will be a memory. And then that same voice said to me, well, that's all everything is, just a memory. So no matter where you are in the world, you can close your eyes and you can see yourself back here. So that's when I began to realize that everything is here. And whoever controls your memory, whoever controls how you think and what you think, determines how far you go. So that's been one of the tools that has allowed me, a non-Egyptologist, to do what very few Egyptologists have ever done, and that is to be an active participant and a funder of an archaeological dig. As I say, I'm not an archaeologist, I'm not an Egyptologist, but I'm doing this stuff. Why? Because I feel I am in tune with my ancestors who have paved the way for me to do these things. Why me? Because I've, I, I've been obedient. I've been doing the work, and this is the reward for doing the work. Okay? Yeah, that's okay. Okay. In terms of who are you doing the work for, who's the audience? Who do you want to share the most information with, and what are you expecting them to do with this information? My primary, my primary audience is my people. Uh, we have Who are your people? African people, right? Uh, as John Henry Clark said, listen up, listen up. Are we all African people? Uh, no, no, I mean black folk, all right? You want me to be specific, all right? <laughs> Why? Why? Because as Dr. John Henry Clark said, we have been written out of the respectable commentary of human history. People have stolen us, then stole our history, and then have the nerve to tell us that we're not Africans and that Egypt ain't in Africa. What kind of nonsense is that? That's nonsense. It is nonsense. It's craziness. So what I learned from that first trip to Egypt in 1980 is that I've been lied to all my life. I've been lied to all my life by white folk and black folk. And the black folk who lied to me believed in the white folk who lied to them. So my job was to travel and to see things for myself to get the physical evidence, to go there and see it for myself. And then to be able to use my artistic skills, my design skills, uh, my media skills, to make that information palatable to people who have been socialized not 
to read, not to enjoy reading. So uh, that's why The Browder File is such an easy read. It's a short essay for people with short attention spans. Now Valley Contributions and Civilization is three books in one. There's one book with just text, just tons and tons and tons of text. And then there's another book with just pictures, illustrations, photographs to speak to the right side of the brain. And then I've got information in the sidebar. So there's, I've got three different ways for people who've been socialized not to like history, not to believe that they're Africans, to begin to digest this information, to internalize this information. So once you begin to internalize this information, it excites something inside of you, right? And it makes you want to read. Uh, a good friend of mine now, uh, David Banner, the rapper, the, the actor David Banner, right? David called me up Christmas three, three years ago and told me this story of how The Browder Fire was the first book he ever read from cover to cover and that that book has changed his life. He said he, he speaks to the broader file as being the book that changed his life. He said, brother, whatever I can do for you, I would do. I hear the same thing from, from hundreds of people, thousands of people, you know, wherever I go. People tell me how much that book changed their life. So I know that there are people now who are looking for the truth, who didn't, who didn't get in school, didn't get in the church, are not getting it within their social environment, but they're looking for the truth. So there is something inside of us that longs for something that our oppressor has been trying to suppress and destroy. There's a war against African knowledge. That's real. There are white folk out here who don't want us to know the truth. Why? Because if we don't know who we are, then we'll act like fools all the time. And they will be comfortable in our foolishness. Case in point. I was told not to say this, so let me say it in a kind way. Dress up, dress up. I dislike Tyler Perry because I think his movies, Medewa, is the worst thing. Is is the worst thing that that the, we need to be internalizing right now. I think someone's right recording now. that. Someone's filming you say that. I music. don't like. I dislike Lee Daniels. I think Lee Daniels has done black people irreparable harm with Precious, with Monsters Ball, and with Empire. I know from my own personal experiences that the dramatic uptick in violence among young African American sisters in high schools now is a direct result of them watching Cookie on Empire and bringing that craziness in the classroom. I know that for a fact. And so these young people don't have conscientious parents in their households to say, well, baby, you know, I'm not going to let you watch that. Or if I am, if you are going to watch that for every one hour of, of, of Empire you watch, you've got to watch three hours of something positive. So this is my thing. This is my thing. There is an unfair balance. There is an imbalance of negative portrayal of African people in the media. All right. I want to see more positive portrayals of black women, more positive portrayal of black men. I want to see more portrayals of black men and black women together. I don't see that. I don't see enough of that. And until until I see enough of that, that I'm going to complain about those people who continue to give us nonsense year after year. And so the issue is, we support that because that's what we're used to. That's what makes us comfortable, right? And that, I was going to say that consciousness, but actually it's a lack of consciousness. That lack of consciousness has to change. It has to be replaced with um, a, a sense of consciousness that validates our humanity. And that validation of your humanity says black people don't criticize other black people. Black people don't, should not, African people should not call other African people the N word or the B word or the H word. Conscientious people don't do that. They don't do that. And so we have to demonstrate to our children how real men and women should conduct themselves and what better place to do that than in your own home you control what goes on in your household you control what your children listen to you control what they watch and if you allow your children your precious possession to internalize this pornography this profanity then shame on you shame on you you're not doing your job as a parent so we have to take this thing seriously we are at war 
People destroy us, and the first battlefield in any war takes place in the mind. Whoever controls your perception of self has already won the battle. So we've got to be serious. I also understand that not all of us are prepared to be serious. Not all of us have the mental capabilities of being serious because of all of the things that we've been consuming that have destroyed our brain cells. So that's a reality. So I'm interested in partnering and working with people who are serious. Uh, Brother Paul, I mean, I've been working with Paul for over 25 years, right? And he's in the fifth, he's in like the seventh, eighth generation of that timeline. That timeline is an incredible visual tool for teaching African history. So we have to support those people who are doing the work. And we have to speak out against those people who are betraying African people. That's why I talk about half a dollar. That's why I talk about poop dog. And, and those Negroes who have made billions of dollars and destroyed hundreds of thousands of lives. In my hometown, Chicago, in my hometown, Chicago, over 10,000 black males were killed by black males yes. in one decade. More people who have died in the 15-year war on terror in Afghanistan. But nobody is talking about this as a major problem that they seek to address. And what, what motivates these young black men to kill each other is listening to that nonsense from Poop Dog and these Negroes. So they have been responsible for the death and incarceration of more black black folk in the Ku Klux Klan. They need to be called out. They need to be held accountable. And until we do that, we have to do it. Because white folk are not going to do it because it helps to serve their interests. Did you all see Straight Outta Compton? And I'm sorry for just dominating. I'm, no, I'm on No, it's so rap. good. It's so good. <laughs> Give me a bright name. <laughs> Did you all see Straight Outta Compton? Yeah. All right. In that movie, Straight Outta Compton, that one scene that got me was when uh, Ice Cube had been kicked out the group. He left the group and then had been dissed by his brothers, right? And so he makes uh, a CD, and he's, he's, he's ragging on them, right? And so they bring the CD home, and they're listening in Easy es house, right? So one by one, he tears each of them down, right? Ooh, and they're laughing. Ooh, he's talking about you. Ooh, he's talking about you. But then when he says something about Jerry, they're Jewish manager, Jerry gets upset and says, I'm going to sue him. I'm going to call the JDL and we're going to sue him. Now stop for one minute. Jerry didn't mind when he was calling black folk niggas, bitches, and hoes. But as soon as he says one thing about Jews, he's ready to take him to court. What does that mean? It means that as long as you respect yourself, your enemy is quite comfortable. But don't you dare say anything about me. Why? Because there's power in the word. So if we can't talk bad about anybody else, we should not be talking bad about ourselves. It's simple. It's basic. And once we know that, and once we teach our children that, we change everything. So that's what, you know, all of you all who are here should take that message back home because that's something that you have control over. All right, so you should exercise control in your household. You should exercise control over what your children are internalizing if you truly love them. Now, if you don't love them, you let them listen to whatever they want to. So when they engage in self-destructive behavior, I don't want to see you on television boo-hooing about, oh, your son was killed and he's a good boy. No, he's not a good boy because you weren't a good parent. I mean, we got to take this thing seriously. We really have to take this thing seriously. We need to stop blaming other folks for the things that we aren't doing. Take responsibility for yourself first. No. I know a lot of people want to ask questions. You're going to get your time. I promise you. We've got about seven minutes. I've got a couple more questions. I see some hands going up. There's going to be a card system. Is there going to be a card system? There's going to be a number system. I'm going to give you your number. You just show me your hands in seven minutes. Whoever wants to ask a question, you remember your number, and then you can direct them straight to the front. A couple of things. This is just like me and you in my living room, right? So a lot of our people are invested in tribalism. You know, I will fly the flag of the Black Star Ghana, you know what I mean? I get very excited when I'm in Trinidad and connected to my other cousins. Um, how if, though, you know, I've had some good experiences, but how for those who, I'm not worried about anyone in this room, by the way, but for those who can't even connect in terms of the African-Caribbean connection, how can we get those folks to connect to Kemet if they can't even connect to each other 
you know, when they got planes and they got trains and oyster cars and all these things, and they still don't look at each other with oneness. Sure. Well, the first thing that I know is that this information is not for everybody. I'm not going to fool myself to think for one minute that we're going to get all black folk on the same accord. That ain't going to happen. That's unrealistic. All right? This information is for those who are ready to receive it. All right? and, and I also know that you have to reach people where they are. You can't come to somebody with, with information about Kemet and all this stuff if they don't even know West African history and culture, if they don't even know the history of their hometown, if they don't even know their family history. So start with the simple things. Start with simple steps. Get people interested in wanting to know who their ancestors are. All right? Get them to begin to understand the significance of acknowledging Big Mama. When you sit down and meals together, then 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 speak the names of, of, of those ancestors who are no longer here, who made it possible for us to be here. Take baby steps and let them understand how important it is to acknowledge those who are responsible for paving the way for us to be here. We didn't get where we are by ourselves. Many people within our family have made contributions that are unimaginable for us to go to school, for us to get a good job, for us to live where we live. And so you start by acknowledging those black lives that matter to you. Everybody can relate to that. And then once they begin to become comfortable with that, then you take another step and introduce them to something else. And then you take another step and introduce them to something else. So we have to realize that it took 500 years to create the disunity that we see among our communities. It's going to take another couple of hundred years before we totally neutralize that insanity and are able to build communities that we've become self-sustaining for generations. So it takes time and we have to be willing to invest time in ourselves and our families first. Family first. Mm -hmm. Family is first. Talking about family, this is my last question. My mom's of mixed parentage. She's half German Swiss, half Ghanaian, so she's not really half German Swiss. She's quarter German, quarter Swiss, but you know where I'm going with this, right? We know that there are many biracial um, people in existence today. You know, some researchers suggest that you know the, the the white black mix will be the predominant race in X amount of years to come. How does one coexist with that? My my grandma used to laugh at my mom when she fired off, and she'd be like, "Oh, don't worry, it's it's the black and white conscience fighting within her. Leave your mom alone." How do, how do we coexist? Whether we are black or white or mixed race, how do we coexist? John Jackson, one of my favorite scholars, uh, one of my favorite persons of all time, uh, wrote in the Introduction to African Civilization. He dedicated that book um, to the human race. There's no such thing as race. Race is a false construct, right? And everybody is of African ancestry. Everybody is African, right? So what we need to do is to get back to the source. So um, this idea of this idea of, 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 of black people being biracial, what's interesting is uh, one of the best examples of a biracial person was Barack Hussein Obama, right? His mother was white, his father was, was African, but how did white men see him? They saw him as a nigger. And they disrespected him more than they disrespected any other president in U.S. history. I know folk in the states who, who work for Secret Service and Barack Obama received more death threats than all the presidents of the United States because he was black. They didn't see him as a mixed race person. So, uh, you know, what we need to understand is, is something that I, I, I wrote in the, uh, the revised version of the Browder file. Uh, I added four new essays and the last essay is co Color, Culture, and Consciousness. Color is a game that races play to divide us, right? Uh, culture is an important part of the process to regain an awareness of who you are, but the bottom line is consciousness. Consciousness. Consciousness transcends race. You know, what I found throughout my career is that there are some good white folk out here who have been extremely helpful to me. So I'm not going to deny somebody simply because they're wearing a white suit this lifetime, right? I've encountered a lot of black folk who have robbed from me. Who, who, who don't appreciate what I'm doing because I'm working with a white woman. So there's craziness out here. And at some point, we've got to rise above the craziness and understand the thing that is really going to help everybody get through this is your consciousness. Your consciousness, what grounds you to be able to look at another person 
and to, to look beyond the color, look beyond the sex, and look at what's in that person's heart. That's what really matters. But we live in a society which is so steeped in racism, which is so steeped in division, that it minimizes people's ability to do what we all have a responsibility to do. So what is going to push this thing further is for more people to begin to cultivate their consciousness. And in order to do that, you have to protect what comes into your mind. You have to protect uh, the, the, the music that you listen to. Right? You have to protect yourself from, from the images on television and the movies that are designed to confuse your consciousness and, and to separate you from your real self. You have to be able to spend time with yourself, to cut off the television and the radio and just be still and listen to the voices of your ancestors inside you who are trying to tell you to sit down, baby, and eat right. You know, and do some exercise and start reading more and start call up your sister who you haven't spoken with in three years. Huh? You know, there's some things that we have to do. And once we start doing those things, you'll be amazed at how it opens up other avenues of opportunity and success for you. We are in control of our lives. And when we take responsibility for our lives, you'll be amazed at the turn for the positive that your life takes. So that's something that I know everybody has the capacity to do. And once we begin to do that, you will begin to see how easy it is to become your authentic self. Brother Tony, thank you very much. You're welcome.